Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me uh, to be part of the summer school. Uh, so my title is The Evolution of Empathy. I hope it has something to do with the evolution of consciousness. Um, before I start, let me just acknowledge uh, the work of my collaborators. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, research relevant to empathy, the psychology of it, the neuroscience of it, um, and the social and biological basis of it. You can see lots of names. Uh, some of them are psychologists and uh, people involved in imaging, and some of them are looking at the role of hormones and genes. <laughs> so, um, just by way of, uh, of situating my topic in the wider uh, theme of, of this, of this uh, course, um, when I think about the term consciousness, I think it's uh, way too broad and uh, that it's useful to make distinctions about what we're conscious of. And uh, here I'm just making some very basic distinctions between consciousness of the physical world, um, like this furniture, uh, versus consciousness of mental states. Uh, so thinking about your own mind or somebody else's mind. And I think that uh, these different types of consciousness uh, may involve very different sorts of psychological and ultimately uh, neural mechanisms so, and it, with their own evolutionary history. So they're just important distinctions to draw. Uh, thinking about your own mind or thinking about someone else's mind may involve the same machinery, the same neural machinery. People have argued about that. But I think that both of these are very different to um, consciousness of color and um, other kind of sensory information. Consciousness of another person's mind uh, is sometimes referred to as having a theory of mind, having a theory that there are minds out there, and I think it overlaps with this concept of empathy. So that's the focus of my talk. So first of all, what is empathy? Uh, I think that it has two, at least two components, and if you read about empathy, you'll find uh, some people argue there are even more than this. At a minimum, I think there's a cognitive aspect and an affective aspect. So the cognitive part I define as the drive to identify another person's thoughts and feelings. So it's putting yourself into someone else's shoes to imagine what they might think or feel. Uh, I would also say that's the recognition element, recognizing someone else's mental states. Affective empathy is the drive to respond with an appropriate emotion to someone else's thoughts and feelings. So uh, this is the response element, um, separate, I think, to the recognition element. And I'm going to argue during the talk that this distinction is very important because when we look at specific uh, neurological conditions, we can see a dissociation between these two types of empathy and that they might have their own uh, distinct um, uh, uh, functions which may have been selected for very differently in evolution. The other idea I want to introduce is um, the idea that empathy is not all or none. It comes by degrees. So here we have the familiar bell curve um, and the idea that empathy um, might be um, low, average, or high. Most of us are going to be in the middle of this distribution with average levels of empathy. Uh, but just to illustrate um, examples of people who might be very high in empathy or very low in empathy, I thought I'd start off with uh, a little uh, vignette of Raoul Wallenberg, who uh, many of you will have heard of. He was a Swedish diplomat working uh, during the Second World War in Budapest when he saw Jews being put on the trains to Auschwitz. Uh, and he decided to use his status as a, as a Swedish diplomat to get onto the train, issue fake Swedish passports to the prisoners, um, and then tell the Nazis who were waiting on the platform that these were Swedish citizens and that they should be taken off the train. He then uh, um, rented 32 different buildings in Budapest and put the Swedish flag outside them, calling them things like the Swedish Cultural Institute, 
the Swedish Library, the Swedish Research Center, uh, but actually hid Jews in all of these places and is estimated to have saved tens of thousands of individuals. So I think he was using his empathy, going way beyond uh, what most individuals did, uh, and might be an example of someone with very high empathy. In contrast, we can look at these two Nazi scientists working in the Dachau concentration camp during the Second World War. Uh, they were conducting experiments. Um, here is a, an inmate of the concentration camp, and these two doctors were performing what they called a freezing water immersion experiment to see how long a human being could stay alive in freezing water. And like good scientists, they took systematic measurements, including duration until death. But again, from the perspective of empathy, it's hard for us to understand how one person is able to turn off their empathy towards another uh, to treat them just as an object rather than as a person with, with thoughts and feelings. So I think that kind of illustrates the two extremes of the empathy bell curve. In terms of science, how we measure it, um, one way to measure empathy is using questionnaires. I'm a psychologist, and we developed this thing called the empathy quotient, the EQ, uh, and you simply read each statement and say whether you agree or disagree with this as a description of you. And there are lots of examples. These are just two ex items here. And it does give rise to that empathy bell curve. So now we're not looking at a model. We're looking at real data that most of us are in the middle. Some people do indeed score very high. And uh, there are people who are very low. There's a sex difference that women in the general population score slightly but significantly higher than men. These are the means, and here are the standard deviations. Uh, and I'll come back to that, because I think that the role of gender in empathy um, has, a, has a repeating theme. Uh, another way to study empathy is to use performance tests. So it's not just about self-report, which might be open to all kinds of uh, biases and be unreliable, but to actually ask people to judge how someone what someone is thinking or feeling. So on this test, it's called the eyes test. You look at photos of facial expressions, but just the eye region, and you have to pick which of these four words best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Here, the correct answer is dispirited, that she's a little bit sad. Uh, and uh, if you got that right, you did it on the basis of quite minimal information of cues about someone else's mental state um, from facial expression. Uh, again, we see in the general population a small but significant sex difference that women on average score slightly higher than men. It's only a two-point difference, but when you run the statistical test, it turns out to be a significant difference. So again, these sorts of performance tests are revealing individual differences in empathy. So. Um, Social psychology has had a long tradition of trying to explain um, why our empathy might be higher or lower in different situations. And Stanley Milgram's famous experiment, uh, where uh, he showed that people are quite willing to administer electric shocks to a learner if they're instructed to do so by an authority figure, suggests that obedience to authority could be one factor that might lower our empathy in certain situations. So that would be a social account. Another social factor that people have argued uh, that might affect our empathy is in-group, out-group relations. So here we ha have an image from Rwanda, and uh, I'm sure we can all remember um, the horrific genocide that took place. But uh, it was mostly about one ethnic group using propaganda to dehumanize the other group, uh, describing the other group not just as the enemy, but as subhuman um, and as cockroaches, allowed one group to switch off their, their empathy and, and commit horrific acts of, of, of genocide. So this would suggest that social factors can influence how much empathy we have in a given situation.
But I don't think those kinds of social factors can really explain individuals like Ted Bundy. So Ted Bundy, some of you will remember. Um, I'll give you a quick biography of him. He started off his adult career as a psychology student at the University of Washington, and he volunteered on a telephone helpline, uh, and he won the trust of women who were in distress using the telephone helpline, asking these women to meet him, and went on to rape, mutilate, and murder many women over many years. Uh, so he, he had a, a, a career as a serial rapist, um, and one view of psychopaths like Ted Bundy is that he had good cognitive empathy because he was able to deceive other people um, very convincingly, but he lacked affective empathy in that he didn't seem to care about them. The evidence that psychopaths like Ted Bundy have low affective empathy, I think comes uh, from this experiment by James Blair that was conducted at Broadmoor Hospital in the UK. So he tested a group of psychopaths and a control group, and he showed them three different types of images. Um, threatening images, neutral images, and then images of people in distress. And he measured uh, physiological arousal in response to each of these types of images. What he found was that the psychopaths only showed reduced physiological arousal in response to the images of people in distress. Uh, so they didn't differ from controls in response to the other kinds of images. So this suggests that they've got uh, low affective empathy. Raises the question about where this reduction in affective empathy comes from in individuals who go on to become psychopaths. And John Bowlby, whose work is, I'm sure, familiar to most of you, uh, working at the Tavistock Clinic in London, argued that if you look at individuals who are already on a trajectory for antisocial behavior, uh, like delinquents, many of them suffered early neglect and um, abuse in their childhood. So he argued that the lack of an opportunity to, to, to experience parental affection and love in early childhood can lead to the loss of empathy by, by the teens. Um, I think early experience can't be the whole story because not everybody who suffers neglect or uh, early abuse turns into a psychopath. Uh, and uh, instead, we need to think about, on, over and above social factors, the role of biology. This is a, a study that was conducted by Avshalom Kaspi at the Institute of Psychiatry, also, also in London, where he looked at what's the likelihood of becoming a delinquent by your teenage. Uh, and uh, what he found was that um, your likelihood of delinquency certainly increases if you've experienced severe childhood maltreatment. But it goes up even more if you're also a carrier of the MAOA gene, one particular version of that gene. So it's a gene-environment interaction. And we can see the role of uh, genes interacting with environment from this adoption study. Again, if we take uh, an index of empathy uh, as um, petty criminality or delinquency or antisocial behavior, you can see that when you look at individuals who, who have no risk factors, uh, they have low likelihood of, of criminality in adulthood, exposed to environmental risk, so being adopted into a family whether there was criminality in the parents increases the child's likelihood of becoming a criminal. Uh, sharing, uh, well, having biological parents, so not the adopted parents, but the biological parents who were criminals, also increases risk of criminality in adulthood. And of course, the uh, the worst case scenario is where you, where your biological parents had a criminal history and you're adopted into an environment uh, which is high in criminality that pushes up your own individual risk even higher. So we're seeing the role of both environment and genes. And if, we've, if we're seeing the role of genes even in a modest way, 
in something like empathy, it raises this whole possibility that empathy is the product of natural selection and that it may not be uniquely human. We may be able to find it in other species. So Franz Duval, the primatologist, argues that you can see precursors to empathy in other species, particularly monkeys and certainly apes. And he argues that if you look at behaviors like this, where monkeys share food, even with unrelated individuals, they help each other when one is injured, for example. They show consolation. So particularly when two male monkeys um, have been in a fight, as is common, uh, and one wins and one loses, many of the members of the group will come over to the loser and just touch him on the shoulder after the fight, which is obviously prone to anthropomorphism uh, in how we interpret this, but Duval argues that maybe this is some sign of consolation, being able to recognize the emotions of a conspecific. Uh, and certainly monkeys seem to be able to read each other's emotional expressions, uh, at least to be able to distinguish if, some, if another animal is being friendly or being aggressive. So some signs that, that the precursors to human empathy might exist in other, other social primates. The only experiment I've been able to find which has tried to test this was by Jules Masserman at Northwestern University way back in the <coughs> 1960s where he trained rhesus monkeys to pull a chain to get food. So that was very straightforward conditioning, learning. Uh, then he changed the contingencies. So now if they pulled the chain, they would not only get food, but they would also see another animal getting an electric shock. And what Masserman found was that the monkeys stopped pulling the chain if it meant getting reward was at another animal's expense. Uh, indeed, if you read the account, one monkey refused food for as long as 12 days. So this suggests that some elements of affective empathy may be present in other species, other primates. So this idea that uh, there might be genes for empathy led us to collect DNA from people who were filling out that questionnaire, the EQ. Uh, we took the opportunity of asking them not just to fill out the questionnaire, but to give us uh, a buckle smear where you get a <coughs> cotton bud, you scrape it inside your, the, your mouth, and a few cells come from your cheek, and it gives you enough uh, tissue to be able to analyze genes. We picked a bunch of candidate genes. All of these, all of these acronyms represent a different gene, uh, and all of these are ones that showed statistically significant association with score on the EQ. Uh, some of these genes are involved with neurotransmitters like GABA. This is the GABA receptor. Uh, some of them are involved in uh, neural growth. These two genes are involved in uh, the sex steroid hormones like testosterone in the synthesis and uh, uh, transport of the sex steroid hormones, which may be relevant to the sex differences that we saw earlier in empathy. And that led our group to look at the role of testosterone produced by the fetus to see if it had any role in the development of empathy. What we've been doing is asking women during pregnancy uh, who are having amniocentesis, where a needle is introduced into uh, the amniotic fluid for clinical reasons, uh, and where that fluid is being sampled to test for chromosomal abnormalities because maybe the baby's at risk of Down syndrome, we've been asking those women if we can have their consent to analyze the testosterone levels in that fluid. Uh, just because we know from animal research that testosterone during the fetal stage has organizing effects on brain development. Um, so we, the design of our experiment is we measure the testosterone levels in these otherwise healthy babies, typically developing babies, wait for the baby to be born and look to see if there's any relationship between prenatal testosterone and uh, aspects of child development. And just to jump straight to one result, that when those babies were eight years old, we gave them that test of cognitive empathy. Uh, so now the, the words have been adapted to be suitable to an eight-year-old child. Uh, 
but the format is the same. Which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling? Hopefully you're all going to get this one right. Uh, the correct answer is that he's interested in something. But more relevant to this study, we've got testosterone along the x-axis and your score on this empathy test on the y-axis. And you can see that there's a negative correlation. The line is sloping down, meaning the higher your prenatal testosterone, the more difficulty you're having eight years later at decoding facial expressions to figure out what someone might think or feel. So over and above the role of uh, social experience, which I don't want to minimize, uh, and uh, possibly genes, we're also seeing that hormones, uh, particularly testosterone, uh, are associated with, uh, with outcome in empathy. I'm just going to go back to this slide because I realized that we've got this very bold title to the slide, Genes for Empathy. And some of you may be thinking, surely genes can't code for something as complex as empathy. And I would agree with you if you're thinking that, uh, that if, to the extent that genes are implicated, of course genes only code for proteins. And there are many steps from the protein through to the brain structure, the brain function, and the behavior. So all we're really seeing is an association between genetic factors. And now with this hormonal study, we're seeing an association between hormones and empathy. We can't go as far as to say it's playing a causal role, that, that in this case the hormones are causing um, uh, high or low empathy, because all we have is a correlation. And in human research, it would be patently unethical to manipulate the hormone levels, to block them or to increase them, to see what effect that has on empathy levels. Uh, although those, those sorts of experiments are being done in, uh, in rodents. I haven't spoken yet about a different psychiatric condition, autism. Um, many of you know that I work at the Autism Research Center uh, in Cambridge. And people with autism have difficulties with cognitive empathy. Um, they struggle to understand other people's motives, intentions, uh, beliefs, and, uh, and feelings. Um, they don't tend to hurt other people, uh, but they tend to be confused by other people, and so they withdraw from other people. Um, so it looks like difficulties with cognitive empathy may lead to social confusion rather than cruelty, whereas difficulties with or, or, or low levels of affective empathy could uh, lead to acts of cruelty. People have looked at uh, affective empathy in autism, and uh, it looks like affective empathy may be intact, in that if you tell someone with autism that somebody else is suffering, it upsets them, just as it upsets the rest of us. So um, this leads to the idea that maybe autism and psychopaths are mirror images of each other, that the psychopath has good cognitive empathy, that's how they can manipulate and deceive other people, uh, but they have low levels of affective empathy. Uh, people with autism may have intact affective empathy. Uh, they care about other people uh, not suffering, uh, but they struggle with cognitive empathy, being able to put themselves in someone else's shoes to represent another person's state of mind. So when we find in nature uh, a dissociation of this kind, it implies that there may be distinct brain basis to each of these different components in empathy. So that leads me on to a little bit of, uh, of the neuroscience. So far I've said nothing about the brain uh, and empathy. Um, this slide simply reminds me to tell you that empathy isn't associated with a single region of the brain. There are many different parts of the brain that have shown different associations with empathy. So instead, we might talk about an empathy circuit, a network of regions. Um, so on this chart, you can see at least 10 different regions. And for reasons of time, I'll just go through a few of them. 
we might start with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex in red. Um, and we know that this is involved in empathy from this very famous neurological single case study of Phineas Gage, who many of you will remember back in the 1840s uh, suffered uh, damage to his ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, when he was working on the railroad track and uh, dynamite blasted a metal rod up behind his eye and through his brain. The relevance to empathy is that before the accident, he was described as a very sensitive, courteous, considerate individual. After the accident, he was described as very rude and no longer able to judge what was socially appropriate in different social situations, the implication being that he'd lost his cognitive empathy. Um, we've looked at, uh, at uh, people um, doing that eyes test um, where you're judging uh, what someone else is thinking or feeling, but whilst the person is lying in an, an MRI scanner, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, and found that uh, that sex difference that we saw in, in terms of performance on the psychological test of empathy is mirrored in terms of brain activity that women in the general population show more activity than men in the left inferior frontal gyrus, there it is, um, whilst they're looking at someone else's face and trying to infer their mental state, so another frontal region. And I wanted to highlight a, a limbic area, the amygdala. Um, this study comes from Jean de Setti at the University of Chicago where he took delinquents, teenagers, who were in trouble for antisocial behavior, and he showed them short video clips where somebody experiences pain, such as uh, this piano player uh, where the lid of the piano suddenly crashes down on his fingers whilst he's playing. And de Setti was interested in which parts of the brain respond when you see somebody else suffer. Uh, what he found was that uh, in the amygdala, we, we all have two of them, one on each side of the brain, uh, there were differences in the levels of activity in the delinquents compared to controls when they were seeing somebody else in pain. So the amygdala seems to be another part of the empathy circuit. And you can see that that's echoed here uh, in this study looking at uh, typical, uh, typical individuals and uh, individuals who are rated as high in callousness or lacking in an emotional response to others, whilst they're looking at fearful faces, which is a good way to wake up the amygdala, you can see that, um, that those who are rated as more callous show less activity uh, in, in the amygdala. And uh, uh, there are some other brain regions. Here we've got the anterior cingulate cortex, um, which again shows reduced activity uh, in, in delinquents or children with conduct disorder um, whilst they're looking at emotional pictures. And a final region to mention is the insula, uh, but this time it's a structural study, so looking at the size of a particular region. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is that these teenagers with conduct disorder or delinquency uh, have a smaller insula compared to controls. Um, just looking at the volume of different regions. So uh, people suggest that that might be another part of the empathy circuit. So I just had a little prompt that I should be wrapping up. I'm going to start with some conclusions uh, that I've outlined um, what we could call the empathy circuit in the brain. Uh, and we can think of this as the final common pathway um, upon which social factors and biological factors can impact. So we saw some examples uh, of social factors like early neglect and abuse uh, or like obedience to an authority figure or the, uh, the role of propaganda that might cause us to stereotype um, uh, and members of the outgroup, social factors. But equally, we've seen examples of biological factors that can impact the empathy circuit including genes, uh, hormones, and neurological damage. I've also tried to argue that it's important to distinguish between cognitive and affective empathy. 
uh, because if you um, either have damage in one or the other, the outcomes are very different. And just keeping in mind those very different clinical profiles of autism and the psychopath might remind us uh, that these two components of empathy play very different roles. And I've argued here that low affective empathy may be necessary but not sufficient for acts of cruelty. That's to say that once someone has, has uh, once somebody has reduced affective <coughs> empathy, that sets the stage for cruelty. It's a precondition for cruelty. Um, but, but we can't say that it's sufficient because someone could have low affective empathy and shut themselves away in their bedroom and not, um, not act in any way towards another person. So low affective empathy doesn't lead inevitably to, to cruelty, but I think it's a precondition for it. Low cognitive empathy, in contrast, doesn't seem to lead to uh, cruelty, but could lead to social confusion and withdrawal. Uh, the second set of conclusions relates to um, the broader theme of, of, of this uh, summer school, uh, which is that evolution seems to have been shaping um, empathy, and we can think of scenarios in which it would have been adaptive to have low empathy, and um, depressingly, we can see that that could be the case for people who are psychopaths, or even if they don't have the diagnosis of, psychopath, of, of psychopathic personality disorder, if they simply had many of those traits, uh, that could have been highly adaptive in allowing them to operate in a very self-centered way, but also able to manipulate other people to their own advantage. High empathy, we can equally see, might have been highly adaptive, and one view about the sex difference that we see in the general population in empathy, um, speculatively, is that uh, if our ancestors in evolutionary time, uh, if females had a larger role to play in childcare, empathy, having high empathy, might have um, in ensured that your offspring had a better chance of surviving to the age of reproduction, because if you have a baby that can't tell you what it's thinking or feeling, being able to read its behavior and interpret its needs uh, may mean that uh, the baby survives to pass on uh, its genes and therefore your genes. Um, my second point here is that an optimal level of empathy in the population may turn out to be actually in the average, the average level. And uh, I was struck when I showed you that bell curve that most of us are in the middle of that range uh, we might like to think of ourselves as, as having good empathy, but actually on tests of both self-report and performance, most of us come out just average. And maybe that is a sort of trade-off uh, that is optimal, because too much empathy means that you're over-focused on other people's needs, maybe to the neglect of your own. Too little empathy means that you may not fit into a social group uh, because of being solely focused on your own your own agenda. Uh, so having some sort of midpoint might actually uh, be the best possible outcome. Uh, and finally, I've tried to argue that uh, the functions of cognitive and affective empathy uh, are very different, and both of them may have adaptive significance. I'm going to invite you to visit our website if you want more details about any of the studies I've described. Thank you. Thank you.